Okay, very good. So welcome back everybody and I should give a, a special shout out to all of our friends on Facebook. Uh, I heard that IT was watching, if, I, if you're still there, how's it going? And I hope all the nuns have survived the fires and that you're back home again. Uh, and yeah, for all of those people watching on Facebook, number one, delete Facebook. <laughs> number two, if you are going to be using Facebook, at least use it for something good. So I'm glad to see that. Okay, so where are we? Oh, that's right. We were encouraging people to get off social media. Now, <coughs> dependent origination. What I'm going to do for the next session is I'm going to go through the meaning of the terms in dependent origination. All right? Now, f so it's, I think it's important because it is a complex teaching with many different ramifications. It's important to sort of take off bite-sized chunks, right? So we're not, in the last session, we looked a bit more sort of general background and so on. I'm going to return to that in a minute, but I want to sort of, first of all, let's get some, let's get some basic definitions under our belt, right? So we've got an agreement at least to what the terminology is that we're talking about. Does that sound like a good idea? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the suttas have a pattern where they tend to do that. And so the pattern basically is that they have a, a, usually, they have like a short place where they state the basic teaching, which we've already seen in the last session. And then they have another genre of sutras called the Vibhanga sutras. And Vibhanga sutras essentially take those terms which are found in the short teaching and then give a definition for each of those. All right? And that's what we have here. We have a Vibhanga sutra. It's giving us a definition for each of the terms we found in dependent origination. And so this is a quite a somewhat compressed way to handle knowledge because obviously every other time the dependent origination appears, it doesn't define the terms, right? But obviously you're meant to read it understanding the main way that it's, ter that it's defined in these terms, okay? So let's have a look at that and let's see what the definitions say. So we notice this is the sutta number two in this collection. So this is the Nidana Sangyutta uh, and in the... Uh, in this collection, um, the first one we read before starts with thus, so I've heard and so on and so forth. This is the second one. It's already abbreviating all that stuff, right? It's already, you know that things. So let's abbreviate it. At Savati, that's all we need to know. I will teach and analyze for you dependent origination. Dese Sami Vibhaji Sami. And what is dependent origination? And here the Buddha is repeating what we heard in the previous sutta. Ignorance is a condition for choices. Choices are a condition for consciousness. Consciousness is a condition for name and form. Name and form are conditions for the six sense fields. The six sense fields are conditions for contact. Contact is a condition for feeling. Feeling is a condition for craving. Craving is a condition for grasping. Grasping is a condition for continued existence. Continued existence is a condition for rebirth. Rebirth is a condition for old age and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness and distress to come to be. That is how this entire mass of suffering originates. Right? So this is just repeating what we've heard before. Now the Buddha is like taking it to the next level down and saying, well, what do each of these words mean? Uh, and so we we'll go through and have the definitions. So what is old age and death? And the Buddha takes up old age. Uh, the old age, decrepitude, broken teeth, gray hair, wrinkly skin, diminished vitality and failing faculties of the various sentient beings in the various orders of sentient beings. All right. Any questions? <laughs> Seems pretty straightforward, right? Yeah. Why are you laughing? I don't know why it's funny. <laughs> you're, you're thinking of all those old people and you're laughing at them, or what's happening? That's pretty accurate. <laughs> it's very vivid, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a very vivid kind of observation about what old age consists of. Yeah. So he doesn't euphemize at all. Right. He's just like, this is how it is. Yeah. Yeah. Right, he's not, it's not like some kind of marketing spin on it, you know. <laughs> old age, you know, well, you know, it has its benefits, you know. <laughs> old age. Yeah. <coughs> All right, please, please, please ask questions as we go through. That's not enough, he goes into it more. Then... 
So I should just say the, the various orders of sentient beings here is a translation of the Satta Nikaya. Uh, and the word Satta Nikaya, Satta means a sentient being. Nikaya here is an order or a uh, dimension. So what it here means is like the human realm, animal realm, deva realms, and things like that. All right. I'm surprised at how few questions there are, but please go ahead. So like when it's saying the failing faculties of the various sentient beings and the various mm. orders of sentient beings, mm. that part, I guess, is, I don't understand it as well? Or is it like something sits with it? What, what part do you understand or what some part is unclear? Oh, no. Um, like I get, you know, various fa failing faculties of various sentient beings. Right. And I guess in the in the various orders of sentient beings, right. it seems redundant, or like there's something I'm missing. Ah, uh, yeah. So like saying that it is, it, it's a bit duplicated, it's a bit duplicated, but just think about it, you, you, you think about it, say, as meaning of the various sentient beings, wherever they may be and whatever kind they may be. Something like that. That's really what it means. Does that make sense? Not really. Let's go on and let's see if it makes sense later or if we'll may not or whatever. Sorry, yes. I was just wondering if like maybe the duplication was due to the fact like that at least for me, you know, maybe a tendency to assume maybe in the data realms, maybe they don't you know deal with all the age the way we do. Right. Right. Yeah, I think it's in, it's in, it's that's right. I think it's making it making sure that it's it's universal and it's all encompassing. Yeah. Exactly. Yep, wherever you are. Yep. Good point. So then death, the passing away, perishing, disintegration, demise, mortality, pining for the fjords. No, sorry. Uh, death, <laughs> decease, breaking up of the aggregates and laying to rest of the corpse of the various sentient beings in the various orders of sentient beings. So just as English is rich in terms for... <laughs> Decease. He is an ex parrot. Then we. <laughs> See, I think this is lost. Like, I, think, I think younger people here don't get that, right? Yeah. Does anyone know that? Yeah. Yes. A few people, you guys know that? You just don't think it's funny. Okay, fair enough. No, I, that's all right. <laughs> all right, fine. Okay, so again, pretty. Pretty straightforward, very explicit, very clear, quite definitive, right? So, what, what is the, what's he, who's he referring to, or what is he referring to? Various orders of sentient beings. You well, know, that's what we, we like talked about before. Or, you know, the right. Higher or you know, people have uh, their higher order people. You know, like well, like and queen, you know, that's like a caste system. What are, what are they referring? No, no, to? no, no, like like uh, animals, oh. animal realm, human realm, deva oh. realm, all of that kind of oh, thing. Well, insects. Then. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. Maybe orders isn't the correct term there. Maybe you should translate realms or something like that. It's a bit hard to disambiguate things sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What's the um, empty parentheses at the end of the Pali? Uh, that's, a, that's a technique which the Pali edition is using to indicate that there's extra text in certain editions. Oh. So there'll be a variant reading there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is called death. All right. Such as old age, such as death. This is called old age and death. All right, we good? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go on next one. What is rebirth? Katamata bikwe jati. The rebirth in so remember, of course, when when giving these these lists of synonyms, basically, you, I mean, don't take them too seriously, right? I mean, you basically got a list of synonyms in Pali, and you have to hunt around to try to find synonyms in English that will more or less match up with it, right? Yeah. So don't try to go for too much of a one-to-one -one mapping, but the rebirth, inception, conception, reincarnation, manifestation of the aggregates and acquisition of the sense fields of the various sentient beings in the various orders of sentient beings. This is called rebirth. So obviously most previous translators translate jati as simply birth, uh, but actually I believe that's an incorrect translation. Uh, jati never, when we say birth in English, then typically it means the emergence from the womb, uh, which is not what jati means in Pali. Jati, the emergence from the womb, like we say, when you know, a baby is born, is vijati, there's a specific word for it. Jati itself is a term for uh, the actual start of life. 
and uh, it always, basically, it always means rebirth, right? I, I mean, there might be a few contexts where it doesn't, but basically, almost always, in this kind of doctrinal context, it actually means rebirth. It's talking about that, and uh, so I think it's inaccurate to just refer to it as birth. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm slightly curious about your translation of Abhinavati as reincarnation. Right. Like when I see Abhinavati, I think of production or manifestation right. of appearance. Right. So I'm curious why you chose reincarnation for that word. Yeah. Um, look, you, you could do. I'd have I'd have to look back and see exactly why I chose that. A lot of time it's just to do with juggling synonyms and trying to get something to work in that particular context. Sure. Yeah. I mean, one, one of the things that I do think, though, is that like the word reincarnation has kind of been taboo in Buddhist circles for a long time because we've been so concerned to distinguish our theory of rebirth from the Hindu theory of rebirth, which, fine, they are distinctly different theories. That's fine. But reincarnation actually doesn't really mean Atman, right? It doesn't really in invoke that theory. Reincarnation means just go going into a new body, which could be consciousness going into a new body. So it's more just actually just a, the custom that that's how they tended to have been used. So this is why uh, I mean, some of my proofreaders argued against it that I shouldn't use the word reincarnation for that reason. Um, but what, the reason that I'm using it is because one of the things that I find when teaching suttas is that people kind of get stuck on terminology and they get stuck on the words. Right, rather than trying to look, well, what are the words saying? Uh, and so just to try to get that idea that, you know, the, the difference between Buddhist theories of rebirth and Hindu theories of rebirth is not that we use this word and they use that word. It's that there are different sets of underlying assumptions and so on, which are informing the way that we explain the process. So that's what it's important to understand. So on yeah. line, how do you handle the word I think also seems to be in the same Yeah. Yeah, I think I think to to appear or reappear, something like that. I'd have to check it. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a list of terminology somewhere, which you can have a look at if you want. There's like a thousand something terms, and which are used, you know, relative fairly consistently. Yeah. But something like upapajati is so common, it's probably going to be hard to keep it completely consistent. Mm. Though it seems to be mostly used in the sense of rebirth. It does. Yeah. 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 It seems like it really doesn't fit in in, 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 uh, in, that con in the context of Buddhism reincarnation, I feel. Like, I, I see reincarnation more like um, in terms of maybe uh, Christian or something or Hinduism, maybe you know, like use that word reincarnation. Just, it's, just, it's, it's, it's just a word. Words don't belong Buddhist. to people. <laughs> Or groups of people, they just have a meaning, yeah. So the literal meaning of reincarnation is just to go. Translations do, you know, yeah, words. In the, in the yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, let us continue. Please come in just in time. We just missed all the boring bits. You've come in time for the fun <laughs> bits. <laughs> Did you? We were, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so there, what is continued existence? Another one which is not easy to translate, and often the, the simplest words are the hardest to translate, right? So the, the word here is bhava, which is a very basic, simple word. It's just the noun from the verb to be. Uh, but of course, it's such a common, basic, word is used in countless different contexts because it's so simple so it makes it tricky to translate so what is bhava what is continued existence i've translated it as there are these three states of existence tayome bhava existence in the sensual realm this realm of luminous form and the formless realm this is called continued existence okay so this is this is you know you can see there's not like i'm not translating it entirely sort of word for word literally here but i'm trying to convey the kind of the sense of it when we say the word bhava has often been translated as becoming, right, which is definitely an incorrect translation. Okay, it should never be translated as becoming. Um, for a start, you can see it has. There are three bhavas, right? You can't have three becomings. It's not a countable noun, right? It just doesn't work. But more to the point here is that the whole idea of bhava 
is that bhava is some kind of state of existence. Okay? And the reason that people are attached to it is because they want to get reborn in some state of existence where you're going to be happy. Right? That's the point. And the Buddha came along, Devi Dana that he is, and said, all of these things are actually impermanent. Right? And then people say, oh, the word bhava means becoming because it's an impermanent state. But no, that, that's like the Buddha's critique of the idea of bhava. That's not the meaning of the word itself. Right? So you can't read the... This is, a, this is a, a sort of a dialectical misunderstanding of the nature of translation. So it doesn't mean becoming. Sometimes translated also as being. Right? But being also is problematic for a number of reasons. So then also sometimes translated as existence. Or actually a reasonable translation of bhava in many contexts is simply life. Yeah? Bhava means life. As in, in my past life, I was Cleopatra. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So that's kind of basically what it means, right? So in English, you could say, well, in my past existence, I was Cleopatra, or in my past life, I was Cleopatra, but you can't say, in my last becoming, I was Cleopatra. <laughs> right? It's kind of weird. So Buddhism has a rich and quite complex vocabulary for talking about these kinds of things. And of course, as with anything, it doesn't really map one-to-one -one on a lot of the, the concepts we have in English for talking about them. So we just have to sort of lunge around the corners here a little bit and try to say what it is. So the idea here is that when it's talking about bhava in this kind of context, what it really means is that this kind of this, the continuation of this kind of state of being or projection of it into the future or into another state of being or something like that. So it has this idea that, that, that through this process that we're, we're prolonging or continuing this kind of state of being. And it's important to remember this, especially when you come to the cessation side of it, because it talks about the, the cessation of bhava, right? So dependent origination is the cessation of existence. But it doesn't mean that when you understand dependent origination, you just like pop out of existence, right? It means you're not part of that process, which is building up continued existence in different states in the future. Yeah. So this is the reason that I translated here as, as sort of continued existence, trying to get this sense across. I don't know if it works or not. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. So it's like, uh, so you mean it's sort of like, we can see it as sort of like the existence of the self. No? Something like that, yes. It could be. Although, I mean, underlying it, yes. Underlying it is that, yeah. that idea of existing of it. But when people think of it, like people might think, oh, you know, I just I want to get reborn in heaven. You know, they don't necessarily think, oh, I want myself to be reborn in heaven. I mean, the idea of a self is underlying it, mm -hmm. right? But it's not necessarily what they're thinking. Mm. Yeah. So it's just that idea that somehow I want to continue. I want to keep, I want to be in the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to die. Ultimately, Bhava Tanha ultimately is. I don't want to die. No. <laughs> I want to be something in the future. All right. How are we going? Everyone sticking with me so far? Okay. That's good. Right. And so these three states of existence, existence in the sensual realm, the realm of luminous form, and the formless realm. Well, I, I don't know what the luminous form is. Don't you? Formless realm. <laughs> what do you reckon? If you were to take a guess, what, what would you say? Sensual realm. <laughs> what's what's that? <laughs> Tell me about touch, the sensual realm. You know, touch, feeling, hot, right. Cold. So 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 to be reborn in the sensual realm. Form my spiritual. Something self, like that. Yeah. Exactly. So it's being reborn in the sensual realm means being, being reborn in some kind of state where you get to experience all that sensual stuff, which might be like you get to experience like lots of good stuff that is very pleasant and happy, or you get born somewhere else we experience like lots of bad stuff or you might be born in New York where you experience both of them at the same time at, maxim <laughs> at maximum intensity right <laughs> right but the point is that, the, that it's like that right that, that's that's the kind of the defining characteristic of it yeah? luminous form yes you're right it's, it's a kind of it's essentially it's the realms of existence which are created by the practice of jhanas so if you practice deep meditation, then your mind becomes very purified, very bright. And then, yes, you still exist and you still are in the future, but in this kind of awesome, 
made of light kind of thing, right? And so this manifestation is pure, powerful light. And formless realm is like even better. Like formless realm, you're like not bothering with all that showy light stuff, and I'm just going to be like infinite space. I mean, it's weird when you start thinking about this, right? So like if there are beings in the realms of infinite space, are they like permeating our bodies right now with their infinite consciousness? No, none of this is form, none of this is enlightenment, right? So the point is that even these super subtle and super refined states of being are still some kind of state of being. Yeah? Do we have it only in meditation before the formless, luminous form, or...? Pretty much, yeah. Only in meditation, in the jhana, is it? In the jhanas, yeah. When you are out of jhana, you're back to central... Well, well, the... the so, so... Uh, okay. So the idea of bhava like, is something like a state of existence. So in this, we're here in the manusa bhava, right? This is the human realm, the human state of existence, right? And the human state of existence has a certain kind of rough baseline of where we are at, right? When we, we have sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch, right? So we have these basic senses. And we have certain capacities to experience, but not everyone has those senses, right? We have a certain capacity to experience things, but of course that also varies quite a lot, right? We have a capacity to say, uh, do things like make decisions, right? As humans, which something like say, uh, uh, an earthworm does not, not in that same way, right? And so on. So there are certain qualities that are characteristic of the human realm, but of course they vary a lot. They vary a lot from person to person within this realm, and they vary a lot within an individual person in this realm. And we go through many different states, even just when you fall asleep at night, right? I mean, your consciousness changes radically when you just fall asleep. Yeah? So the human realm is not static, right? But it's more just like a spectrum or a kind of default where most people in the human realm tend to be around that kind of way. But also within the human realm, if we meditate and we develop good meditation, like coming to the retreat next week, then we can elevate our mind, and maybe even experience these beautiful states where your mind is filled with light and bliss and joy. And there you're experiencing something what it's like in the realm of luminous form. Now if, uh, when you get reborn, if that is the dominant experience which is propelling you to get reborn, then you'll be reborn in a state which is something like that. This is the idea. Understand? Because this is changing our consciousness. Our consciousness is what leads to be being born. And the way that our consciousness is, and the kinds of uh, karma that we're making there, will tend to shape the form that our future lives will take. So this meaning is, at the, uh, the moment of the death, yeah. if the mind is in a kind of like a jhana state, yeah. in our formless, so when you're reborn, you will... It doesn't just have to be at the moment of death. Actually, the moment of death is a bit of a furphy. Right? Do you know what a furphy is? I think it's an Australian. Kara? Yeah. Do you want to, you want to translate Furphy? Um, I mean, I don't know. How do you translate <laughs> it's a difficult. It's a difficult ask, isn't it? Difficult. It's a difficult yeah. ask, yeah. It's, 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 a, I think. it's a poly. <laughs> <laughs> furphy, I think it's translated. I think it's with a PH. Furphy? Right. <laughs> furphy. Yeah. Australian yeah. slang <laughs> for an erroneous or improbable story that is claimed to be factual. Yeah, but not like closely associated with idiots who say the word, oh. you know. Anyway, sorry, I should go, go back. Anyway, sorry, sorry, pardon me. F uh, so yeah, so the whole end, like last mind moment thing and stuff like that, don't worry about it, okay? Right? What actually determines your rebirth is how you live every day yeah, and the choices that you make. Yeah. Because you could live like a monster all your life. Right. And last second you think, you know, if you for me, you know, you're feeling great, well, you're going to be a great guy. Or? Right. Yeah, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. Sorry about that. But the, <laughs> it's like rats. I mean. Okay, so there's a couple of cases in the suttas where somebody had some kind of dramatic deathbed uh, conversion, right? And then they maybe get a good rebirth because of that or something like that. So yes, the point is there that that kind of redemption is possible, right? But the Buddha is never actually teaching you should do that, yeah? <laughs> right? 
You, I mean, actually, this could be another app. We've been thinking of some good ideas for apps, but that would be a good like. <laughs> that would actually be a good app for the Theravadan world, right? You could have a last mind moment redemption app, <laughs> right? Do what you like, and this app's like monitoring your life signs. And so when it can see that you're, you know, you're having a heart attack or something, it'll flash up and say, "Be mindful now! Be mindful now! Be mindful now!" <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? I think the law and also discussions about child and new birth. Yeah. There is a black hole level, but this one was applied to black hole level in our daily life in terms of ignorance and choice and consciousness and the rebirth and the death of certain unharmed in our daily life. Is that what the sort of said? No, I was asking. So. Well, what did, what, what did the Sutta say? Pardon? What does the Sutta say in terms of rebirth? Rebirth, old age and fall and die and rebirth? Yeah. But that, can that apply to basic craving in daily life? Did, does, is, is that what it's applying it to here? I'm not sure. But you can read it what it says, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what it's saying there? Mm -hmm. No. Huh? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Next, continued existence, grasping. Upadana. So often, grasping often translated as clinging, uh, but I prefer grasping because clinging is specifically not letting go of what you've already got. Right? You cling to something when you've already got it. Grasping, going out to get hold of it. So, uh, and this, of course, grasping independent origination is about going out and getting more in the future. It's not just holding on, on what you've got. Now, this is quite a subtle one, okay? Chattari mani bhikkhu upadani. Grasping at sensual pleasures, views, precepts, precepts and observances, and theories of a self. Right? Four kinds of grasping. All right? Now, the next one is what is craving. The six classes of craving. Uh, craving for sight, sound, smell, taste, touches, and thoughts. All right. Now, normally, uh, upadana or grasping and craving are quite similar in meaning, right? I mean, if you say that you're grasping for something or you're attached to something or you're clinging to something or you're craving for something, it's, it's a similar kind of meaning. There may be some nuances of difference, but it's a, quite similar. And typically uh, in the Buddhist texts, like the Abhidhamma texts and so on, when it lists these things, it will say that these are just synonyms which of course then raises the question of what's the actual difference between one and the other. Like why do you have both craving and then grasping? Right? And this is a exegetical problem in Buddhist uh, uh, the um, theory about trying to understand and explain what the difference is. Okay? Do you understand the problem first? Yeah, all the other ones we've seen, we've seen these different terms and they have distinctly different meanings, right? You know, old age and death and rebirth and so on. They're quite distinctly different terms. One thing's causing another. Here, two things that basically seem to be pretty much the same thing. And yet here they're distinguished. Why are they distinguished and what's the point of this, this nuance? Yeah. It seems almost like craving um, refers to the future that you're talking about. Okay. But, it's, but, that, but it isn't clinging, right? Yeah. So this is why I rejected the rendering as clinging, no, because grasping is also going for the future. So the two things that's noticed is craving seems to be the future. Then the other thing is you have craving versus grasping. Like craving seems, you know, uh, senses. Right. Whereas up there, the grasping you know, involves views and things beyond the senses. Right, right. So what does that, what does that suggest or what? Okay, good. I mean, I think that that's a good point, and that's a really important point. But what's exactly is going on? Yeah. So craving seems something that's more like a, a mental or an emotional action. Okay. Grasping seems more active. Than okay. Embodied. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think yeah. The is, is, yeah, like you said, emotional is. I think it's something like like unconscious. 
conscious urges or emotional reactions or something like that? Right, right. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm a little lost because they seem to be pretty simple to me. I mean, grasping is holding on to something that you have. Craving is wanting something. Right. Right. Okay. Sometimes you translate as thirst. Tanha. Tanha can, yeah. Literal, literal meaning is thirst, yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that differentiate much better between that and grasping? Would it? Not sure. Anyway, uh, don't 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 get hung up too much on the the exact rendering of the translation, but more just think, think about what, like, what what are the different ideas that's being talked about here. Look at the definition of it: craving for sight, sound, smell, taste, touches, and thoughts. This is grasping at sensual pleasures, views, precepts, and observances, and theories of a self. Kara. I feel like sight, sound, smells, taste, touch, and thought are more transient, like impacts upon us. Like we can't always see what we want to see or hear what we want to hear, so it makes okay. sense that we're craving for them. Whereas like theory of a self I can hold that with me or my views or my precepts I can hold them on me okay okay that's good come back to a few people we haven't heard from yet uh, yet go on So the, okay, so so the, the the grasping at a sense of self can kind of emerge from the things that we're craving, in some way, yeah. Feels very chicken and egg. Okay, which is fine, right? That's the whole thing. Is basically the chicken. The whole dependent origination is chicken egg. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Right. Our right. World, while the sensual pleasures, views, precepts, observations, views of self seems more like the internalized. Okay. Like the things that you don't have to, like, you know, you can close your eyes and like, plug your ears and you can still sure. you know, have views and ideas and theories of self. Right. It's a little harder to make observations. But right. I think this is kind of getting towards it, but it's, we're still not really hearing about why it's one and then the other. We have the dream is then. smaller. Gentleman here has had his hand up for a while. I mean, I'm paying possibly undue attention to the preposition for and craving foresight, sound, smells, touch, taste, touch, thoughts. Right. And the, if it was just craving sight, sound, smells, touch, taste, thoughts, I would think of it as like, okay, there's a, like, I'm seeing this and I want this thing. Right. And so I'm craving this thing. But this seems, the for makes it seem before that, that it's like there is a thing that's kind of bored and interested in sights appearing, thoughts appearing, sounds appearing, etc. Like interest in the stimulus and of the really? sense aside from just what you're sensing. Well, I, I certainly had did not was not thinking about that when I made the translation. I can yeah. I don't have to think about that, I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Venerable Sir. Craving for particular experiences. 
Remember, it's the other way around, though. We're like we're reading it backwards, so craving comes first. Oh, this might be yeah. This might be one thing that's actually confusing about right. So in the sequence, right? I've, that's probably my my fault. Ha ha ha. Anyway, so we're reading it backwards, right? So we're reading it from the end, right? Or the way it's defined, beginning with aging and death, and then going back through it. So craving is actually earlier in the sequence than grasping. Yeah. So no one noticed that, did they? And I just took it for granted, didn't I? Yes. <laughs> That's bad teaching, Sujato. Next time. Okay, can I just, with that newfound common ground that we are now on, let's just go back and revisit the sutta that we read earlier uh, about the infant development. When the child is born, the child grows up and his faculties, his senses mature. Right? And then he amuses himself with the five kinds of sensual stimulation, sights and so on and so forth and so on. So we're seeing, and then when you see something that you like, then you learn to approve, welcome and keep clinging to it, to keep, keep holding on to it. Right? So here is ajosaya, a different word for clinging and grasping. And then this is, this is leading to rebirth. So you see this is actually a, a more detailed description of the craving uh, part in dependent origination. So you see how it works? It says there's one word which is found one way and then it's explained in a more, this is in a more kind of real life context. Yeah? It's almost like a narrative context that's explaining it. But, the, but that, the, that aspect of child development is I think really important. Think about it. Yeah? Does a child, what does a child do? Or like what about Stanley? Right, where's, Stan, where's Stanley? Is he around? <laughs> So he's probably, what's he doing? Is he going ab around uh, somewhere uh, right now? Is he going around there practicing some ritual observance? <laughs> Possibly not. Is he going around reading a book on the philosophy of the self? Eh, never know. Is he going around craving for something to eat? Yeah, <laughs> fairly likely, right? So you can see these these as being kind of an evolution from like the, the craving is a more primal drive. Yeah, get, want, rah, right? See, smell, taste, touch, have, right? And then the grasping is more intellectual, right? It's more reflective. It's not completely intellectual, right? It's still got the sensual pleasures, which it still includes that, right? It's not completely different, but the emphasis is shifting. So the craving is more like the underlying, you know, this is something I feel a few of the people were sort of getting to with, with their responses, right? It's more like an underlying primal drive, which an animal has, or like a young child has. Uh, but then through growing up, you learn to think about things, reflect on them. And then, so these things like having views, having opinions about things, right? Having like a sort of uh, formalized cultural observances that have some kind of purpose, right? Uh, these are things that grown-ups do. Yeah? Personalization. Sorry? Personalizing. Right, yeah, and so we're, it's much more sophisticated, yeah? And so this is, I think, one of the reasons why, I'll, I'll come to your question in a sec, it's one of the reasons why I think that in, in Buddhism, uh, the general idea is that the main karma that you do, right, the main stuff that you do that actually powers rebirth, happens in the human realm. Now that's not to say that it can't happen in other realms, because it does, right? But the most most potent realm for creating a place you get reborn is always said to be the human realm. And I think this is really the reason why, because we develop these faculties where we have this intelligence. And what that does is that focuses and makes our cravings and our desire and our actions consistent. Whereas an animal is just like, oh, I'm going to get that and eat, and now I'm going to, oh, I'm going to play, and now I'm going to sleep, or whatever. So the, 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 the desires are more kind of scattered, more instinctual, and they have less kind of force. Whereas you see, you know, and you can see this has very, very real effects, right? If animals fight, two animals come together, they yelp at each other, scratch at each other, and then five minutes later they're running around playing together. Because there's no, there's no, there's no co coherence or consistency in that. With humans fight, they make a war and lay waste to nations. Yeah? 
because of ideas, because of the grasping. We don't fight because of craving. We fight because of grasping, because we're attached to the views. I'm right. Yeah. So this is focusing our karma in a much more stable, focused, long-term direction. Yeah. It has a cultural dimension, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes. Um, I mean, so, sorry, sorry, to interrupt, but yeah, the precepts and observances, sila bata, is definitely has a cultural dimension, right? Quite explicitly, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, it seems to be a distinction between sentience and sapiens. Okay. Right. Have a sense of self awareness. Right, yeah. And it's that self awareness that distinguishes the human from the animals. Right. Like, either in the Buddhist context or, you know, secular materialist science. Right. And also, that's, I think it seems to be related to, you know, the famous Cartesian formulation, I think, therefore, yeah. Whereas right. a chimpanzee doesn't think in that sense. In that kind of way, yeah. But, he, but of course, he, you know, you know, ha having said all that, but the, and I think that's that's a great distinction. But the, of course, y you can never make like absolute boundaries in these things. I mean, the chimpanzees do go to war, right? And they have like sustained wars over many years. Oh, I hate for everything's yeah. fuzzy. Yeah, everything's fuzzy. Yeah. So uh, yeah, but just as a sort of general tendency, like the general tendency, grasping is more intellectual, it's more theoretical, it's more adult, it's more human, whereas craving is more primal, more animal, more innate. Yeah. yeah, so um, I, I didn't mention the grasping part before. So I wanted to say, like, I feel like grasping essential pleasures and human pleasures is almost like saying, um, like, personalizing something, like saying, this is mine, this is my pain. You know? Right, um, yeah. So now I'm personalizing it in, or, or grasping. Like, yeah. You know, this is my, these are my views, personalizing. Right. Exactly, yeah. Are my presets, right? right? Right, Exactly, yeah. And 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 uh, uh, again, like an animal or something like that doesn't really do that in the same way, or not to right. the same degree. Yeah, they'll enjoy the taste of eating the mo meal, but human beings, like we think that we're better than somebody else because yeah. we enjoy a different taste than somebody else, yeah. right? <laughs> it's evolution. All right. Okay, so that's good. So we've got craving. So yeah, I should have mentioned we're going backwards. So we're going backwards. And our s now the next s several uh, entries in these definitions are similar, uh, and they all stem from the six senses. So the craving for sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and thoughts. And then what is feeling? The six classes of feeling. Feeling born of contact through the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Um, what is contact? Uh, contact through the e eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. That's contact. What is six sense fields? Six sense fields are the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. So all of these are expressed this way. Of course, there are other ways of talking about these things, and uh, these are discussed other places in the suttas, but it's interesting that in the context of dependent origination, there's like this kind of pattern. So these six senses. And uh, so this, uh, you know, again, corresponding, or you can see that parallel with the, um, uh, the child that's growing up. And like acquiring and developing the six senses is actually hard work, right? I mean, we don't think anything of it because kids just naturally do it, right? But it takes years to sort of figure out how to actually use these senses and what's going on with them. Could you flesh out the word feeling more? Okay. Do you, do you have a specific question well, about that? Just, um, you know, some people define it as sensation, like a physical sensation. Right. Okay, so normally in the suttas, feeling is just defined as either being pleasure, painful, or neutral. Right? So do you like it? Do you dislike it? Do you not care about it? Mental. Uh, but it's also, uh, there's like a mental response to it, right? But the feeling itself can be a physical feeling, so it's a physical stimulus, uh, which you experience as something physical, yeah? but then the mind has a certain, certain reaction to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's it's simple. It's simpler than what we normally think of as emotion, right? Emotions are kind of complicated. I don't know if you've noticed, but 
And so again, Vedana is quite, you know, it's basically getting it down to the really kind of basic elements of experience. Yeah. Uh, and again, think about, about about it a bit like the way that sort of physics works. You know, so physics, you sort of define things in terms of very simple principles like action and reaction. You know, actually the world works much more complicated way than that, but it really helps you to understand how all those complicated systems emerge out of these very, very simple roots. So all of those complicated emotions and things like that, you can say, well, actually they, they all involve these same, these same elements of liking and disliking and so on. Yeah. All right, good. Uh, six sense fields. Uh, okay, name and form. So name and form is another interesting one and one which is uh, um, I think one of the most um, I don't know I don't know if I say misunderstood but tricky tricky to sort of get a handle on what it's actually talking about uh, so the Pali word here is Nama Rupa uh, and again the basic words are pretty straightforward Nama literally just means name so if you say, you know, Ko namo avuso, what is your name? Right? Hang bhante sujato nama, my name is sujato. Right? That's just the ordinary word for a name of something. Form, uh, we discussed yesterday, rupa is, uh, in, we discussed it in the context of the five uh, khandas, five aggregates, has a similar meaning here. Uh, basically, the, 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 the basic root meaning of form is something like the shape or appearance of something. Right? So what, what is the, the form that something takes? But it's also used as a general word for the material realm. But remember that in Buddhism, the material realm is not strongly objectified uh, like it is in a scientific thought. So it's basically our perception, our inner perception of physical and material properties is what it's talking about here. Okay? It's not to say that the term itself uh, implies a particular philosophical position, right? but there's just the tendency when the word form is being used, it means, it means like your experience of hardness, right? your experience of, of, of wetness. These are the four primary uh, uh, elements: yeah? uh, earth, air, earth, air, uh, fire, water, earth, water, fire, and air. So these are um, these have an experiential uh, na uh, experiential quality, which is different a different perspective than the way it's perceived in modern science, which is why. We usually don't. Tra we could translate form as matter, right? But matter isn't quite right because heat isn't matter. Quite is it? You could translate it as something like physical phenomena, but that's clumsy. You could translate nama rupa as mental and physical phenomena. Okay, it's not wrong, but it's not nice either. It's one of the most, most. Difficult ones to translate, so we, this is why we end up translating his name and form, which doesn't quite mean anything in English. But at least you know it doesn't really mean anything, so you maybe try and look up and find out what it does mean. So we will. I'll spend a little bit more time with this one than I have with the previous definitions because it is a bit harder to sort of figure it out. So this is name. So this is this particular definition here. What is name and form? What is nama rupa? Feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention. Uh, this is called name. So we can see here that these are all very familiar terms from Buddhist philosophy. Vedana is um, feeling, perception is sanya, jetana, intention, pasa is uh, contact, and manasikara is attention. Do I have my... I look up on? No, I do not have that on. Okay. Alright, so Vedana is pain. Actually, it's a bad translation, but it doesn't really mean pain, it means feeling. Uh, sanya, perception, jetana, intention, pasa, touch or contact, manasikara, ideation or consideration, really means attention. Okay, and then the four primary elements is earth, water, fire, air. So these are like properties, they're physical properties, right? It's not like literal earth and that kind of thing. I, I, you, hope you know that, right? Yes? 
So I don't know how much to explain whether I'm being too slow or too fast. So if I'm being too slow, just yell out. We already know this stuff. Keep going, okay? But so these are like the, the physical properties. So a bit like, like solid liquid gas we would learn about it at high school, right? The different states of matter, solid, liquid, gas, and heat is the element of change that transforms you from one to the other, right? So it's actually something like, it's quite similar to the modern sort of scientific understanding, but like I said, sort of seen from the inside. It's like seen from a bit of a different direction. Uh, and the form derived from the four primary elements, curiously enough, this is never really defined anywhere in the suttas, but basically what it means, I think, is it means like different aspects of the material world or the physical world, which you can't readily describe by that kind of thing. So that might be something like, say, uh, so the uh, uh, senses and sense experience of things. It might be something like, uh, you could even think of, say, something like gravity, right? And so this is part of how the physical world is, but it's not included in that. So anything which is really uh, derived from or related to those basic properties, but isn't really reducible to them. But like I said, it's not really defined in the suttas. So if you want to, you know, discussions about it, then Abhidhamma texts will have detailed discussions of what that means. Right? So feeling, perception, intention, contact, and attention, this is called name. Yeah? What's, uh, where, 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 are we, where am I losing you? Uh, no, this is this is like one definition. What 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 are name and form? So, so this is one definition here, up to there. Yeah. Consciousness is the next item item in the in the thing. From the six sense fields. So name and form name and form give rise to the six sense fields. Right, I'm, get, I'm getting to that, I'll get to that, yeah. Uh, are we... I'm getting confused. Right? Okay. So remember we started out, think about it here as we're starting out, we started out with the problem, which is old age and death and that kind of thing. Yeah? And we're gradually working our way to the source of that problem. Where has that all come from? Yeah? And we've worked our way back through, um, you know, craving and grasping and that kind of thing. And we've got our way to name and form. All right. And we're a few steps away from actually figuring out what is the source of the problem. Okay, so name is just naming. I will, I'll get onto that in more detail. Okay, so just, okay, okay. we're not finished yet, okay? I'm grasping for You're grasping for straws. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am... I am feeling and craving and anyway okay so I'll, I'll talk about it in some a bit more detail because it's 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 as so often in these things one of the reasons why we find it difficult to get our minds around this concept is because it's very embodied in a culture and in a bit different construct it's, uh, it's answering to a particular set of ideas which are not the kinds of ideas that we're used to hearing and one of the problems is that the Buddhist tradition then ignored that entire previous context and then explained it uh, on a, in a way that's like that 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 just that just sort of acts as if it's a, a term that's sort of cut off. So it's a it's these are, these are old words with rich histories, and they come down to the Buddhist text. And we have this definition here, and the Buddhist tradition sort of treats it as if that didn't happen, and we just start with this definition and we go on. And so in the, in the Buddhist traditions, what you'll find is that they will take this very technical definition here, right? So we've now said name is this bunch of mental phenomena, right? Name is this bunch of mental phenomena, right? And then it will go on and say, okay, so name is an umbrella term for these kinds of mental phenomena. And in later texts, especially Abhidhamma texts, this is, this is how you'll find Nama Rupa talked about it. They constantly talk about it and I'll define it as mind and body. Okay, and they'll talk about it in this way. And it's important to know that that's not how the suttas are talking about it. All right? Okay? 
So there's a quite a distinct difference between how the suttas talk about Nama Rupa and how the Abhidhamma and later traditions talk about it. Okay? What's going on here? The point is that this is a dialectic. The Buddha is responding to people who already had an idea in their minds of what these things are. And he's giving them a, he's giving he's saying these words and these concepts that you think you know, here's another perspective on those things. Right? It's responding, it's a part of a conversation. And if we don't know what that conversation was, we don't quite know what he what kind of thing he was trying to say. Alright? So what I'm gonna do now is share something about what kind of conversation the Buddha was engaging in. Alright? So you ready to go with me on a bit of a journey? This journey might take a bit of time. When I say a bit of time, I mean thousands of years. Eons. <laughs> Hopefully not eons. I'm just wondering, if people are shuffling around. Maybe, maybe, we, maybe it's time to have a break. Should we have a break? Or you want to keep going? Keep going. Let's get through consciousness. Let's get through consciousness. <laughs> Mate. New, New, York, New York Buddhism. <laughs> Let's just get this consciousness worked out. <laughs> Go and have a bagel. Okay. <laughs> okay, fine. Sorry. Moving on. Right. Story time. Story time. Now think about what the kind of process that we've we've talked about before. Yeah? If we talked about it, in, we've been talking about definitions and all of these kinds of things. But try to get some kind of idea of what the process is. Uh, this is kind of idea that there's something like like some kind of sense impact, some sort of thing that's stimulating, something that's nice. You you want it, right? So imagine that like you see something, you want it, right? You maybe you know reach out for it, try to grasp it, yeah. And then when you get that thing that you want, then there's something in that action, something which is inherent in that action that drives you from that state of existence into some new state of existence. Yeah? So of course, I've just been telling you the story of the book of Genesis. Right? There's the apple. Don't eat it, whatever you do. But it looks so nice. Mm -hmm. And Eve reaches out, smells it, mm, looks good, takes a bite. One of the nice things about the story of Genesis is that Eve is said to have taken the apple, investigated it carefully, smelt it, looked at it, examined it, taken a bite, it's nice. She gives it to Adam, he doesn't do any of that, he just says, Ugh, and takes it and eats it. <laughs> <laughs> All right? And as a result of that, they get expelled to a new state of existence where lots of suffering, right? <laughs> yeah, that's where they get to experience, these through birth, aging and death. Yeah? It's curious, it's oddly similar, isn't it? Yeah, oddly similar. And what's happened a bit earlier than that in the story of Genesis, right? God and Adam are wandering around giving names to all the animals. Right? I mean, even if you're a Bob Dylan fan, you know this, right? Now, what exactly is happening, right? Oh, I'll see this animal. This is a nice tall one with a big neck. What should we call it? We'll call this one giraffe. Yeah? This is a nice brown one that hops, we'll call that one a kangaroo. This one is low and doesn't have any legs and sn slinks around on the ground, we'll call that one a snake. So each of the forms is given a name. Right? Each of the forms is given a name. That's what we do. I mean, that's what biology, biologists still do, right? Go around finding all the kinds of species and things like that and giving them a name. Taxonomy. Why? Taxonomy, exactly. So we're creating, in a way, a, a mental map of the world. That's what words do. Right? Now, what's the relationship between the word and the thing? Between the name and the form? 
And we're very sophisticated modern people, right? Or at least we like to think so. And we know that a word has an arbitrary relationship with the thing that it designates. Right? We know that people speak different languages and it's not that one's better than the other, right? They're just different. And so there's no intrinsic relationship between a, a name, between a nama and a rupa and a form. But that's not how m most people or many people in human history believed. Many people believe that there is an inherent connection between the name of a thing and the thing itself. This is why you have he who shall not be named. Because by saying the name of the thing, you invoke the thing itself. All right? So think about how witchcraft works. Yeah? Think about how uh, voodoo works. How so much of this magic and stuff, and you find this all over the world in different systems. You have to know the secret name of the thing. In many different systems, many different tribal systems and tribal peoples, it was very common in Australia. Like you wouldn't have an inherent name. Or sorry, you wouldn't, would, your, your name would be secret. And the name that you actually spoke in public would be different. In Aboriginal communities, one of the common things was that when somebody died, that you could no longer say their name because it would invoke them, right? I mean, if I call your name, you come to me, right? That's not going to stop when you die, obviously. So if I call you your name, you're going to come. I'm like, oh my, God. that's when you freak out. You do not come, right? So you can't say the name. And this, this, is a, this is a major force in human culture and in driving language evolutions. For example, in some of, a lot of the Aboriginal tribes, they have different laws for these kinds of taboos all over the place. But in a lot of them, uh, they would call people by some simple common word, right? So you'd just be frog. That's your name. So when you die, you can't say the word frog anymore, right? So the, the tribe has to invent a new word for frog. Mm -hmm. And depending on the particular rules in that tribe, it might, there might be a lot of complexities in that. One tribe might say, well, look, you can't have words that rhyme with frog because he might just think that you're saying frog and he might come anyway. Right? <laughs> right? And other, and then, then, but then there might be different rules for the men and the women in the tribe. Yeah? And then how are the words adopted? So this is like really frustrating. When the Christian missionaries arrived in Australia, and they're like, okay, let's write a dictionary so we can learn these languages. Yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> right? And this is really driving a lot of linguistic change, these kinds of taboos and things like that. And underlying all of these is the idea that there's somehow an intrinsic and inherent connection between the name and the thing that is named. Yeah? So this is, this is what the idea of Nama Rupa is. Yeah? It's this idea that, that and there's, there's something to that, right? Again, just, just uh, think about how it works in your own mind, right? Classic example, if I say the word camel, right? There's some kind of an idea of a camel has just appeared in your mind that wasn't there before. Maybe it might be an image of it, it might be just the idea or some kind of memory, some kind of association. So we have some kind of, of that, that name brings together with it some kind of cluster of what that thing is. Yeah? So this is this kind of idea that Nama Rupa has, right? So another way of thinking what Nama Rupa is, that Nama Rupa is uh, all of the many different things. That in, in Taoism they talk about the 10,000 things. Right? So the 10,000 things, all the different things that make up the world, all of which have their kind of their names and their places which fit into the, some kind of system. And in the Upanishads it talks, it says that just, it says that all of the rivers have their different names and their different shapes. Each river has its own nama and its own rupa. But those namas and rupas will all disappear into the great ocean, which is the great ocean of Vijnana. This is the Upanishadic doctrine. Again, think about what's going on here. This idea, prominent and explicitly talked about in Brahmanical philosophy in this exact sense. Okay, the names of things, the forms and the shapes of things. All this is what the world is made out of, all of these forms. Prominently, of course, most importantly, for spiritual purposes, 
Sujato, right? My name and my form. Like, that's the most important one. I think we could all agree on that. Right? Okay. <laughs> and so it's, this is the most important form. But all of the other forms, okay, you're allowed to exist as well. So, Nama Rupa, all of these kinds of things, and this intrinsic connection between them. Now, even before the Buddha came along, people realized that this wasn't really the case, right? People realized that actually names and forms aren't necessarily intrinsically connected. But that idea still resurfaces philosophically, right? So there's a strand of uh, Hindu Brahmanical thought that, that, that treats uh, like the Vedas as being like the word of God and Sanskrit as being like the kind of the base language of the universe. It's, it even came back into Buddhism. The Buddha rejected this kind of idea, but it came back into Buddhism. And in the Pali commentaries, we find the idea that Pali is the Mula Bhasa, right, the root language. And that if you raise a baby without teaching them any other language, that they'll naturally speak Pali. Okay? So this kind of linguistic fundamentalism, linguistic essentialism, even crept back into the Buddhist tradition after, even after the Buddha quite explicitly is rejecting it. Yeah? This is how powerful these ideas are. So the reason that I'm talking like this, and the reason I'm going to some length to explain this concept, is because all of these ideas are in you. Right? Don't think that you're somehow better than that, that you've got it figured out. Right? If you think you've got it figured out, it just means you're not paying attention yet. Because all of human history and culture and ideas and things like that are all coiled up inside our minds. And it's all there somehow and comes out in all kinds of different ways. And this is why we still react. You know, and and if, if, you know, if you don't believe me, then just think about... You know, I mentioned yesterday when I was talking about s similar set of ideas of things like, say, The Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter, which actually are based on or use the same kinds of ideas. Why are these things so powerful? Why do they, they obviously impact billions of people and change these lives. People relate to these, these primal... Uh, uh, ideas because they connect with something very deeply embedded in human consciousness. Huh? So this is what the idea of Nama Rupa is. The idea that the world is made up of distinct entities or forms, each of which has a name, and that there's an intrinsic relationship between those names and those forms. The Brahmanical solution to this was that all of those individual names and forms would be dissolved in the ocean of consciousness. Right. The idea there being that, yes, these things have their names and their forms, but there's a consciousness which is aware of those things and which enlivens them and brings them to life, right? This is the Upanishadic idea. The Buddha's coming from, from a slightly different perspective. Here, he's applying a reductive analysis to this idea of Nama Rupa, right? These things that you, t that you think of as, as entities and names and things in the world, actually, they're just made up of this stuff. If you look at closely, you can see there's intention there, there's feeling there, there's perception going on, there's manasikara, right? You can analyze it, tease it apart. You see, actually, there's no intrinsic name that things actually have. But it's actually just this, it's just how the mind works. The mind works by ascribing these labels to things. There's no actually intrinsic form that something has. That, that bell isn't some kind of intrinsic thing that just exists as a form. It's just a, a shape that those atoms have taken on for a period of time. And we see that and we ascribe that the name of the bell, but it's not really essentially what that thing is. So the Buddha is taking, using this analytical and reductive analysis in this place in order to counter the assumption that the world is made up of discrete existing entities with their inherent concepts. That's exactly the response I was hoping for. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Indicating the process by which we put a name to a concept we have for a separate object. Uh, right, but but, it's, but I'm suggesting that, that that that's a more sophisticated approach that the Buddha is using as a reductive approach to the more naive idea that the name is just something which simply inheres in an object. Because um, I, I can see where you're coming from. Like, if we take his list there, we can see it as a progressive thing. Like, you 
right, uh, right. feeling, like some kind of sensory experience of something. Right. And then sanya is the process of identifying right. what we think it is. Uh, Chaitana, we have some thinking process around it. Yeah. Uh, contact, I'm not quite sure is why it's there in the list. Manasikara, we pay attention to it. Like, I didn't see right. how that's all fitting into the process of saying, like, that is a phone, that is a screen. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. So these are, these are the these are the uh, the psychological uh, functions that happen when we do that process of naming something. What I'm not saying is how that's distinctly different from just sanya by itself. Sanya by itself right. already seems to have that idea of splitting the world off into supposedly discrete objects and right. giving uh, separate identities to each of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, certainly think sanya is probably the most you know most important kind of thing there but I think the point is like even Sanya doesn't operate independently right I mean you have to have that contact right you have to see the thing first before wanting to put a name on it so this I think it's just, yeah again it's it's not a different it's saying it's it's a reductive analysis that it's saying that there that uh, there are these different different aspects to the process yeah and I think one of, the, like historically in the Buddhist tradition, I think one of the problems is that the Abhidhamma then takes this reductive analysis, which has a particular rhetorical and dialectical purpose in this context, and then it says everything we can just do a reductive analysis to, and then that's the real actual truth. Yeah, so it's like taking something which actually, it's like just taking it too far, taking it too much. Yeah. Okay, but does that am I am I generally making sense? Does it sound like meaningless babble? I think you had, you had a question over there. Um, well, it, it wasn't a question. It was just kind of related to this pure warmth hypothesis. But cool, maybe. Are you familiar with? Uh, I don't want to distract the other comments, but the teaching. All right. Well, we can maybe talk about it afterwards uh, if you like. Yeah. Thumbnail. The pure warmth hypothesis is simply that people, speakers of different languages, yeah. actually perceive reality in very. All right. A Chinese speaker, a native Chinese speaker, will actually experience the reality, the sensory reality right. around them in a way that's different than an English speaker. Right. Like some languages are more verb based, some are more object based. Right. You know, and so it, 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 it's basically a scientific correlation to a Buddhist concept. Yeah. It's also very controversial in psychology whether it's actually real or not. It is very controversial. Yeah, yeah. But I think that they. You, you it has to, been ruled out. Right, and I think you know, I think there's, there's certainly there's something to it. Really, it's one of those things that's sort of more like like what are the ways that this happens? Like, and I think I think that this is really one of the fundamental contributions that the Buddha is making to our understanding of, of psychology in the human mind is is understanding how that conceptualizing process and that linguistic process is intimately related to how we form and shape our experience of the world. Yeah. Yeah, and this is uh, just remember that these things are still really powerful and they still really matter. Just to uh, give you one example, if 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 you ha if none of you had heard the word meditation, then you wouldn't be meditating. Right? I mean, maybe if English wasn't your first language, maybe if English wasn't your first language, but you have to have the name for the thing. You know, you have to be able to talk about it to point people in that direction. Right, so names names is part of communication, right, and com communicating ideas from one to the other. But that's also part. That's how we build culture, because we have some kind of shared experience, right? So, and that might be a very basic thing, like this is edible and this is not edible, right? Uh, but it also informs our own individual experience. Yeah, the words that we think about our experience will actually shape how that experience happens, even though we not might not be thinking about it at the time. I mean, you think of that Zen simile, classic Zen simile is that the, the, the teachings are like the finger pointing to the moon and not the moon itself. Yeah? But if the finger's pointing a different way, then you're not going to see the moon. So the, you, the only reason you're looking at the moon is because the finger happens to be pointing to it. So it's still actually shaping your experience, even though you might not be seeing the finger at that time, but it's still made it possible for you to have that kind of experience.
Got a few hands coming up simultaneously from here, yeah, yes. So, you know, when you said without the word meditation you couldn't meditate, but we don't need the word to experience the thing, right? So the thing, well, perhaps the thing you do. comes first, right? And then there's the word Does it? attempt to run in. Then in between that there's something as well, sort of ideas about what the well, thing is. Well, this, this teaching is kind of calling that into question, isn't it? Maybe we do need the word for the thing before we can experience it. But then that would imply that nonverbal beings cannot experience. Stan probably doesn't have words for a laugh, but that uh -huh. doesn't stop him from sitting on mine. Right, yeah. So he's, he's probably got, he's got some kind of concept or idea of what a lap is, mm -hmm. but probably doesn't have like a word for it. Yeah, so, so and it comes back again to that idea of Sanya is kind of like pre-verbal. Like I said, we experience it, and it's most obvious in the form of words and linguistics. Um, but again, I think that also comes back to that, that idea we talked about before, of like the difference between craving and grasping. Right? So craving to sit in a nice warm lap is pre-verbal, but sort of understanding, like, if I can manipulate Venerable Sadaso into sitting this kind of way, <laughs> then I'll get a nice warm lap to sit on. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Right, then, so the reason I didn't translate it as mentality is because that's then, like remember what, what I was saying about like the, how the Abhidhamma has this reductive then take on it? So it's basically a pre-digested term, like the word actually means name, and the Buddha's saying, well what you're taking as name, actually if you look at it, is this bunch of mental concepts, which you can mean me mentality. So you can then pre-digest that whole dialectic and say it means mentality, right? which is pretty much what the Buddhist tradition did. Right? But what I'm interested in is saying, well, what was it about to those people at that time? You see, can you see that, that slight difference, that, yeah, that nuance? Yeah, I'm really familiar with the Abhidhamma. So yeah. Kind of <laughs> you can imagine things like that definition, but just like a lot more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Previously, people were thinking in terms of, um, okay, there's kind of this um, connection of like the object itself and then what it's called and all of the concepts and right. associations around right. it. And it's going through and breaking apart that, okay, that can be dissolved into name, which isn't just what it's called, but all of the concepts around it. Yep. And that that is a complex interrelation with exactly, yeah. the thing. Yep, exactly, yeah. I, re I really recommend, if anyone's like interested in a serious study of the suttas, I strongly recommend reading at the very least the Brihadaranika Upanishad and the Chandogya Upanishad. Uh, they're really interesting texts, there's a lot of rich material in it. Some of it is a bit kind of boring, like kind of the ritual things and stuff, you can bleep over that. Uh, <laughs> but there are a lot of really rich and interesting dialogues, a lot of wisdom in there. But also you can see so many of these kinds of ideas, uh, you know, talked about from a, from a slightly different perspective, you know, sometimes the same perspective, sometimes a bit different. Um, yeah, sorry, over here we had, yes. Right. Or right. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and it, has, it has like a practical purpose. Like I emphasized this a lot yesterday, talking about the aggregates. Like this, it's not that this is bad, right? This is actually how we learn to live in the world, right? And you learn this is a cat and this is a, you know, this is a uh, goat and I can milk the goat and if I try to milk the cat, good luck. <laughs> right, so you, you understand, it, it, you understand it, it helps you to navigate the world, but it has limitations. It's not actually how the world is. Like it's, so it's like a set of, a set of guidelines and su assumptions and summaries that give us a sort of a pragmatic map for nav navigating the world. Yeah. On so, yeah. What about um, how humans thought before there was language? Right. People say like that it was mainly image based. Right. And now when I think about how I how I process my thoughts, it's all linguistic. Right. And so, to, do you think link, linguistic based thinking is a way that we kind of get into suffering, so, so to speak? Ooh, yeah, it's interesting. Like, uh, and you know, that's a that that's a cultural evolution. But of course, we've also been through that, you know, in our own personal evolution since we were children. Um, yeah, I mean, all I can say is point back to that idea of that, that distinction between craving and grasping. You know, craving being essentially pre-linguistic and grasping being much more linguistic. It's something that evolves, and it will give solidity and fixity and direction to whatever it is that you want or whatever your attachments are. Um, but I think, I think also just you know just remember that yes, on on one hand with dependent origination, on the one hand, it it is a universal teaching, but on the other hand, it it also has a bit of a focus, right? I mean, it does have a relation to the culture at the time, and it is talking about the kinds of people that we are, like you know, basically adult humans, uh, as kind of the primary audience. Yeah, yeah. But these are fascinating, and of course, it's it's it, it's it's hard enough to understand how our own minds work when they're just like right there, and you can look at them, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And then trying to understand how another mind might work, which works on a fundamentally different way, yeah, or at least not even a fundamentally different way, but on a you know quite different way, uh, is is not easy. Yeah. Something like that, yeah. Because how did how did the Buddha realize this but through sitting and seeing? Right. So we haven't yes, right, but haven't got on to that bit yet. So at the moment, if you recall, this session was about giving some basic definitions of words. All right? <laughs> One chunk at a time. And and already, right? It's not easy, yeah? It's already sort of we got to quite a lot of things to get even just basic definitions of words right, because there's so many assumptions to go on. But yes, it's experience. I mean, you can already look at that and see, or fairly obvious, that there's some parts of it where it's pretty obvious how you do see that through experience, right? Like the six senses and the craving on the senses and the feeling and so on. And so that part of it's pretty straightforward. But then there are other parts where you're more like extending that and drawing from it, and then it becomes less obvious exactly what you mean when you're talking about an experience. So if we have time, we can talk about that a bit later on. Yep. Anyone else? No? Okay, so I'm... Oh, no, we were told that we had to go through to consciousness. Okay, so we've got to do that. Okay, so name and form and consciousness. Now, remember that, uh, that simile from the Upanishads about name, name, Nama Rupa and uh, Vijnana. Nama Rupa, name and form being the rivers and the Vijnana being the ocean. And this is a... The connection between Nama Rupa and Vijnana is very, very strong and repeated often in the Upanishads and talked about a lot in the suttas as well. So in the dependent origination as such, each link is just following the other. But these two links, Nama Rupa and Vijnana, name and form and consciousness, these have a specially close relation. Okay? So here are the six classes of consciousness uh, are defined in the um, uh, same way that we've seen so many things defined earlier, just in terms of the six kinds of consciousness. Eye consciousness, uh, our ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Uh, and so that's not giving us any any kind of um, 
uh, sort of particularly distinctive definition for consciousness here. Uh, other places, though, we find consciousness talked about in different kinds of ways and, and uh, in some interesting ways. Uh, but I'm, I'd like to go. I'd like to talk more about that at some point. But I'm not sure exactly. Not sure whether to go into that in too much detail right now. But what I'll just say for now is to say that vinyana. I'll say a couple of things about vinyana. First thing is that vinyana um, is the uh, just awareness. All right. So it's just the knowing of things, and distinct from what we've seen up here as name and form, which is the mentality or the, the, the other stuff in the mind, feelings, perceptions, intentions, and so on and so forth. So all of that stuff that's going on in your mind, the stuff that you know, right? This is all the Nama stuff, right? The things that's actually knowing all that, yeah? That's the Vijnana. Yeah? So the Vijnana is described, one of the suttas describes Vijnana as like the lord of the city that sits in the middle at the crossroads. And all the, the city has six walls. And so the information comes through the senses and those six doors. Sorry, we see here six doors. The, the information comes in there and the messengers come and they report to the city, to the lord of the city seated at the middle of the crossroads. It's a very evocative simile. So that idea of vijnana is watching. And vijnana is what makes any of the, all of those other things possible. This is one of the reasons why I don't believe that, uh, like when we're in computer science, people want to develop artificial consciousness. These days we have what we call AI, which isn't really AI, it's just a marketing term, but we want to develop, you know, people think that they're going to make computers conscious and these kinds of things. Personally, I don't have any great theoretical objection to the idea that you can make a machine conscious, but I don't think that we're, I don't think there's no road from here to there. I don't think what we're doing right now with computers has anything to do with consciousness. I think the reason that we think it is is because when we started making computers, we started making computers and thinking, let's do some kinds of things that are a bit similar to what consciousness does. And we started making these things that would imitate like doing maths, basic calculators or so on and so forth. And so we tricked ourselves into thinking this is actually doing something to do with consciousness. And if only we could make a faster and bigger computer, do the same thing but more and better, finally consciousness will pop out at the end. But there is no road from here to there. We haven't understood what consciousness is yet. And we haven't even started building a machine that might one day be conscious. Maybe we will. I'm not saying theoretically we can't. Maybe quantum computers, right? Maybe, I don't know. But... Yeah, you know, like quantum computers, yeah, a different thing possible. right? A completely different thing because it's not just on and off. It's on, maybe, or kind of, sort of. I think, or it might be, all right. And you're doing all of that all the time simultaneously, right? So multiple states of uncertainty, and but who knows, right? Will it ever be a thing? Maybe. Uh, so yeah, so and 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 part of it is that from the Buddhist model. Right, it's not that the, 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 the materialist model of consciousness is that consciousness is an emergent property. Right? So you've got basically a bunch of matter, and if you organize matter in a sufficiently complex way with the right kinds of systems and feedbacks and so on, consciousness will pop out at the end. Right? Whereas the Buddhist idea is consciousness has always been there. It's an inherent part of the process from the beginning. Right? And all of these other things depend on consciousness. So we have to sort of figure out a way to bootstrap it from from the beginning being conscious. Yeah. All right. Does that answer your question? Are we good? <laughs> Are we good? Re re relatively good. Relatively okay. So look, let's have a bit of a break. We've been sitting for a while. We've got a couple more items to go in these definitions, but we should. Um, I uh, don't want to do too much all at once, so let's have a break, have a cup of tea, stretch your legs, and then come back. Maybe we can do a bit of meditation when you, when, when you come back. <laughs>